hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance in, incorruptible and undefiled, and that faded not away reserved in heaven for you. You are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye gently rejoice, though now for a season, <clears throat> if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried to fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love and whom Though now ye see him not yet believing, rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Thank you. That was a lot. I'll probably break it up. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Peter identifies himself as the writer, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, some liberals have questioned whether a common fisherman could have penned this letter, and I talked about that as well earlier. Especially since Peter and John were both called unlearned and ignorant men in Acts chapter 4. However, this phrase only means laymen without formal schooling. That is, they were not professional religious leaders. We must never underestimate the training Peter had for three years with the Lord Jesus, nor should we minimize the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Peter is a perfect illustration of the truth expressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. Who'd like to read that? I will. Okay, thank you, Dad. Let me get to it. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. First Corinthians 1, 36. 26. 26. Oh, I'm sorry. 26. 26. Forgive me. Uh, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. <coughs> and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him ye are in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Thank you. Peter is a perfect illustration of the truth expressed in there. So in other words, if you're going to glory, do it for God. And in the scripture... Uh, the, the, in, the, in the gospel accounts, we see Peter, for the most part, he was one of those guys that had the foot-shaped mouth. He would get himself in trouble all the time just by what he would say. And a lot of it was just his impulsive nature. Yes, Vic? Uh, I thought you were talking about me. I'm sorry. Oh, with the foot-shaped mouth thing? Yeah. No, I was talking about me. Um, oh. No, honey, you're confused. Yours is boot shape. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So yeah, so Peter, I mean, we find him in the in the in the in the gospel accounts as being one of those guys. He was just right there, ready to go, kind of. 
I like the quality that's in you. So, Thank you. Uh, yes, yes. It's kind of like we're reading on the spot. Yeah, go, go. You know, he, he was one of those, and that's why I like the book of Mark. As you read through it, you'll find that it's like immediately this, immediately that, then this, then that. It's a, the, Mark, the book of Mark is a book of action. There's not a lot of sit down, take a break, rest. It's like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And it, that's why it's only short 14 chapters. Because, yes. I've heard people say that Peter had an ADHD. He probably did. <laughs> Like yeah, he's like boom, 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 boom. He was, he was a man of action. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, he says later in the epistle. Get ready, because it's coming. You know, he was one of those guys that was like, okay, fish are coming, so I gotta get out there. That was his makeup. That's that's who he was. And it kind of got him in trouble at times. Even though I mean his his motives were good. Hey Jesus! I got this great idea. Let's build a temple for you. Let's build a temple for this guy. Let's build, you know, for and build a temple for this guy because we just saw him transfigured before us. You know, and Jesus is like, no, that's that that's not really why I brought you up here to show you this. You know, <laughs> you know, I can just every so often I can just see I can just see Jesus just going, yeah, oh, <laughs> Yeah, I think. Peter, Peter, Peter. You know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Peter, come on. You know. There you go. And uh, it's—I mean—it's interesting how the the relationship that Peter had with with Jesus and, and the relationship that Jesus had with Peter. I mean, it's it's one of those. It's one of those. I don't want to call it the comic relief of the gospel, but Peter sometimes he just kind of just because he's Peter, you know, he, he's an instigator, he's a leader, but he gets himself in trouble. Peter's given name was Simon. You know that? Really? Yes. Oh, yeah, Peter Simon. Peter. Simon. Peter. Simon Peter. But Jesus changed it to Peter in John chapter one. You can look at that, John. Chapter 1, verse 42. Actually, let's jump up to verse 40. John chapter 1, verse 40. And I'll read that out of the NIV. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that John had said, what John had said, and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him. So brother Andrew is out there, runs into John. John says, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here comes your Messiah right here, by the way, who's also saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Andrew says, dude, i got to go tell my brother. So he goes and he finds his brother Simon. First thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, being Simon, and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Cephas and Peter mean the same thing. Or a stone. Or a stone. Now, why do you think Jesus did that? Changed his name from Peter, or from Simon, to Peter. You know, honestly, I don't know why he changed his name so lot, except that encouragement, edification of that person, that they would live up to what that name means. Because if he, a person really does live up to the name that they're named, whether it be good or bad. And right. so you have to be careful of the, about that. So a mother's or father's given name to their child might mean something great to them, but I think that, that God changed them because he wanted it to mean more to them. I have a special name from God. He changed my surname. Or why is that? Why do you think that's significant? That identifies who Christ sees him to be. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. A stone is solid. Jesus is the cornerstone. 
Correct. And it's interesting that when when, G, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? You know, because Jesus poses the question, he says, who does, what do men say that I am? Oh, you're a teacher, you're a prophet, you're this. But then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And, G, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, then, then Jesus says, you, Peter, have said this, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, the church isn't built on the Apostle Peter. That's not what that means. Yes, that is not what that means. <laughs> the church is not built on Peter. On this rock, the rock that Jesus Christ was talking to was the solid truth that Peter had just proclaimed. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the rock that the church is founded on. Not the person of me. Got to get that clear. I know it's hard for us to wrap around some of our traditional church going, not to mention denominations or religious beliefs. But <laughs> it's not based on Peter, it's based on what he said. On this rock, I will build my church. What does Peter teach us about the trials that we experience? It's a question that's not in your notes. This is this is the interactive part. Say the question again. What is what does Peter teach about the trials that we experience? Good for you. Yes, they're good for you. They're precious. They're precious. Just like a diamond, if you don't go through the pressing. The pressure, you won't come out shining your best. Correct. Correct. And then, how does Peter say we should respond to trials? Resist and stand firm. Stay under pressure. Stay under Remain. pressure. Remain. Remain. Yes. Okay. Let's take a few minutes and go back through First Peter chapter one. One, two, and note any verse that is really encouraging you, and then write it down. You don't have to write out the whole verse, you can just write to reference. Unless you're Sue, and then you can write the whole verse out if you'd like to. <laughs> so pick out a verse that kind of means something to you, and write down that reference. And then the second... Um, question is, we've been chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son, and set apart by the Spirit. In your own words, what does each of these statements about the three members of the Trinity mean? Okay? Take a few minutes and fill that out. 